Good afternoon, and welcome to The Climate is Changing, So Why Aren't We? for Youth Perspectives from the Jesuit Network on Environmental Activism. My name is Chris Kerr at the Ignatian Solidarity Network, and on behalf of everyone at ISN, thanks for joining us uh, today. For over 15 years, the Ignatian Solidarity Network has been uniting the Ignatian family, meaning the Jesuit Network, as well as those who are inspired to work for justice through the spiritual tradition of St. Ignatius of Loyola to build a more just world through faith-based social justice formation, education, and advocacy. If you haven't already, please check out our website, ignatiansolidarity.net, and like and follow us on social media to get the latest advocacy alerts, educational resources, and much more. We work closely with the Jesuit Conference's Office of Justice and Ecology, who are co-hosting today's broadcast. Grounded in Catholic social tradition and, and policy analysis, the Jesuit Conference Office of Justice and Ecology works with Jesuit institutions and leadership to advocate, network, and educate for social and environmental justice, placing the voices of marginalized communities at the center of their work. Sunday marked the fifth anniversary of Laudato Si, Pope Francis's landmark encyclical on the environment. As we celebrate this anniversary, together as an Ignatian family, we recognize that we do so in a different way than we had planned to due to the COVID-19 pandemic. We are holding all of the people affected by COVID-19 in our prayers in a special way today, at a time when we feel the truth shared in Laudato Si, that we are all connected, resonates in our hearts in newer and deeper ways. We hope that this conversation provides us the opportunity to reflect on environmental activism and how we can walk with youth towards a hope-filled future on a healthy earth. So with this in mind, I'm excited to introduce our discussion facilitator, Cecilia Calvo, who will introduce our panelists. Before I do that, however, I wanna encourage you to utilize the comment feature on social media, YouTube, Facebook, or, or sending a tweet uh, to let us know that you're watching and pose questions to our speakers. So we want to know you're out there, right? Make sure to share your questions with us so that we can ask them towards the end of the program. Cecilia Calvo is the Senior Advisor on Environmental Justice within the Jesuit Conference Office of Justice and Ecology. In this role, Cecilia leads the environmental justice efforts of the Jesuit Conference of Canada and the United States, collaborating with province offices, Jesuit institutions, Jesuit affiliated works abroad to promote education, reflection and action to care for our common home and those on the margins. So welcome to Cecilia. Thanks for being with us and for facilitating this conversation today. Thank you, Chris. I'm so excited to be here today with all of you and to welcome our audience and three panelists on behalf of the Jesuit Conference Office of Justice and Ecology. In the spirit of Laudato Si, young people are answering Pope Francis's call to listen to the cry of the earth and the poor, and to renew our relationship with creation. Young leaders, as we know, are at the heart of environmental activism worldwide. Through struggles of resistance and climate strikes, students and youth movements are challenging global leaders to confront an extractivist economy and climate change head on, and to prevent future catastrophe. Young activists are calling us to envision a new way forward one that is in harmony with nature and humanity. I'm thrilled to have three women leaders with us today who are all activists on the front lines of environmental justice and climate change in their communities and institutions. Ellen Haney is a junior at Jesuit High School and a leader of her school's Environment and Sustainability Club. The club works to educate and empower the Jesuit Portland community with recycling opportunities and informational events. Before quarantine, Ellen helped implement the school's new cafeteria composting program. Gabrielle Baker is a senior at Creighton University studying environmental science, philosophy, and Spanish on the pre-law track. She served as the chairwoman of the sustainability committee within Creighton's student government as president of the Residence Hall Association, focusing on sustainable action and education 
and as a leader of the climate movement. And finally, Paisley Sierra lives on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. She grew up with an understanding that Unshi Maka, Grandmother Earth, is a place for all living beings, not only humans. In November of 2019, Paisley attended the Ignatian Family Teach-In for Justice and presented about Lakota culture and indigenous land rights. She is motivated by a love for the environment that views the earth as family. So again, I'm so happy to have the three of you here with us today. And to open up our conversation, just have a question for, for all of you. Um, why are you passionate about environmental issues and what motivates your advocacy? So feel free, any of you, to, to, uh, to jump in on that one. I've always had an interest in the world around me and especially within science, which is where I found my niche in classes and then also just in understanding the world that I was seeing and interacting with. So then through my work within service and justice, uh, I wanted to become an advocate. Um, and I learned a lot more once I attended Cre Creighton University where our Jesuit values really stem from a care for the common home and our neighbors. And I learned that I want to be an environmental lawyer and that we have to be advocates for one another to actually improve the world that we see around us. Absolutely. Thank you, Gabby. For me, part of my motivation is being outside and being in nature. Um, growing up in the Pacific Northwest, I love being outside and reading and hearing about um, <coughs> landscapes and environments that are in danger because of climate change makes me really sad. So I wanted to do something to um, help the help make sure that we can um, maintain our nature and maintain our outside spaces. Awesome. Yeah, I think, you know, I grew up in, in Minnesota myself, and there are many rivers and lakes and just around nature. So kind of that, you know, being in nature and having that space around you, I think, can be um, a, a place where, where that, that love begins, you know? Um, I think my passion, like, started from when I was younger, like, we were raised to believe or to well yeah believe that the earth is our family and to treat it like you because nothing is more important than the other that we're all equal on earth and then like i learned this probably when i was like four or five so i obviously didn't really understand it and then i get older and i like connect the dots a little bit more and found my passion for it that's beautiful, Paisley. Yeah, that um, that that harmony between all of us, right, and our our relationship between um, with creation, between nature and humanity, which I think is really at the heart of what we're talking about today, and at the heart of at the heart of Laudato Si, and and uh, where Pope Francis is is calling us, uh, which is why I'm so happy to have all of you here today in in. As, as, as really leaders, right, that are helping to, to guide us uh, in, in this direction. So thank you. Um, Ellen, uh, as a leader of the green team at Jesuit Portland High School, you have worked on sustainability initiatives on campus, including composting and recycling. What strategies has the green team used to promote better environmental consciousness on campus? Um, so one thing that we're doing right now, because we're not able to be together in person is we have an Instagram. So we're sharing information about efforts that are going on around us and things that we're doing in the school on our Instagram. And then during the school year, we have informational lunches where students can bring their lunch and 
learn about new topics. So this past year we had um, one with my dad who works at Columbia Sportswear and he talked about clothing and how, um, how clothing can be ethically and sustainably made and how we can make good choices with our clothing. And then we also had one about um, ethical and sustainable cosmetics with a woman from Pure Haven who talked about how we can um, purchase safe products that don't have harmful chemicals. So we're trying to um, educate students and help them become more aware of their of how the choices that they're making can affect, affect the environment. Wonderful, Ellen. Yeah, you bring up a really important point, which I think is that purchasing power that we have, right, and being able to make ethical choices uh, with the way, with the products that we, we buy. So not only consuming less and living more simply, but um, making, making those uh, responsible choices and trying to be ethical, ethical consumers. That's wonderful. Uh, Ellen, you also, I believe one of the initiatives that you have been working on with the green team is uh, related to your, to a, your new cafeteria composting program. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So for a while we had wanted to have composting in our cafeteria and our local um, waste system didn't have composting, but we um, started to have food waste. We started to collect food waste in our cafeteria and we, um, we were able to do it for two weeks before quarantine. So we collected two to four gallons of food waste every day um, in the cafeteria. And one of the things that we learned is that a lot of people are really stuck in their habits. So they'll do the same things that they always do. And in order to change something, you sometimes have to make things harder. So we, in our previous setup for the cafeteria, we had lots of conveniently located garbage cans. So we tried to reduce the number of garbage cans and uh, make a more streamlined waste system so that students would go to the composting and um, sort out their waste into recycling and compost and um, yeah. So even though it can be hard to change things when people have specific habits, I think we tried to help people shift their habits a little bit and um, start to compost in our cafeteria. Thanks, Ellen. Uh, that's wonderful to, to hear about these changes. Uh, and it can be difficult, <laughs> to, as we all know, to, to make changes, right, in our lifestyle. Um, and um, so that, that's exciting, exciting, exciting to hear. And, and also, I mean, environmental injustice, climate change, all of these issues are so huge. And sometimes they can feel very overwhelming and kind of this question of, of where do we begin, right? Um, and so kind of for you, Ellen, why do you think it's important to make these small community-based uh, changes that care for our common home? I think what I was thinking about earlier today is there are so many times when the, the government doesn't do what we necessarily want them to. So somebody has to do something and it might as well be you or me or one person starting a movement and starting to do something and then encouraging other people to do it. And then starting small can grow into something bigger. So I think that's why it's really important to do small things, little things, because you can encourage other people to join you and then that can grow and grow. That's great. Thank you. Thanks, Ellen, for, for sharing that with us. Uh, and, and the good work you're doing. Uh, now, Gabby, let, let's turn to you. Um, Gabby, you're a student at Creighton University and a climate advocate who is a leader within the climate movement. From a, from a faith perspective, why do you think 
it is important for Catholic organizations to divest from fossil fuels? That's a great question. Um, Catholic organizations and universities hold their faith as a guide for their actions and motivations in life, kind of exemplified within the Jesuit charisms, um, where we believe that men and women are formed with others and that there is a care for every individual. Uh, I think that is what divestment shows because you advocate also through the use of your money. Um, without divesting, you're supporting any equal practices within these industries, but then you're also not showing that you want societal change. So by divesting, especially within universities and worldwide and even individually, you're able to make a larger impact than you might think because you're able to show your values that have been instilled with into you from the Catholic mission um, of caring for your home and others. Thanks, Gabby. Yes, this this um, this ability to really live out uh, Catholic teaching and principles uh, and and being men and women for others is uh, such such an important such an important element. Um, and with with the question around uh, divestment, Gabby, uh, what strides do you think have been made by Catholic institutions so far when it comes to divestment? I think something that we've really seen happening within the past few years is a lot of discussion, especially around this issue. Two or three years ago, you might not have seen it talked about as much, but then progressively it started to occur within dialogue within students, faculty, and administration within not only universities, but also other Catholic organizations where they were starting to look at their actions and how their money could be used to also show their motivations and wants for their future and the future of our world. And I think that it really has shown how us as a younger generation are able to start to advocate and explain what we want to see happen. And kind of like Ellen was saying, it's a way in which we can change our habits where it might not seem like something if you're just switching a few dollars, but on a larger scale, it can make such a grand impact. And it's not solely happening in universities. It's happened in countries, um, other archdioceses. I could list so many different organizations. If you go on to um, the, Catholic Divestment Network, you can learn a lot more about other Catholic institutions that have divested. And it's really interesting to see how many more people are taking up this torch and wanting to run and start a fire. Awesome, thanks, Gabby. And and you really have been, as you said, um, well, you've been at the heart of some of this dialogue and, and, and having these conversations uh, really is so important, right, about how how through our investments uh, do we do we live out our faith um, and and our values? Uh, and so, how how have you been able to work with students uh, and leadership on campus uh, to engage in in a dialogue on divestment at Creighton? Uh, and and what positive steps have you seen come from this dialogue? Yeah, uh, within the last few years, we've had several students where it's not solely just one or two, like you might see within different movements, but just a large group of us, kind of like we like to say, it's a grassroots movement where though we're not a recognized entity or group on campus, we're showing our wants and values within the work and advocacy that we're doing to help educate, create dialogue and shape the actions of our university. Um, and we're hoping that it will invoke uh, our own beliefs and create a change that we're hoping to see. Uh, we started with a piece of legislation uh, which can be found within our Creighton Students Union as referendum 19-02, which called for the university to divest from fossil fuels, especially from the carbon 200. But um, we wanted this to mainly be about a dialogue and see action within our university so that they could start to divest. Um, recently, although after we had had a student vote, which showed a strong support, we had been told that Creighton would not be divesting. And then a few months later, we got uh, noticed that 
they would reduce their investments from 8.9% to 5.7% within the fossil fuel industry. So although that doesn't show that all that they have created an action plan for full total divestment, they have started to do initial works and have conversations around how they can divest. That's wonderful, Gabby. Yeah, I mean, having seeing that um, that that step already uh, when it comes to reducing uh, investments in in fossil fuels, and I believe you've also been a part of, or or there or or, or Creighton is developing a sustainability plan. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Uh, currently, with the help of our new director of sustainability. He is working with some of our upper administration to try and create a plan for when Creighton can be fully divested and carbon neutral as well. Wonderful. Awesome. These are all really good steps. Thanks, thanks Gabby. Uh, Paisley, let's turn to you. Uh, Paisley, you are a Lakota woman who, who grew up on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota and your desire to want to learn more and do more about environmental issues is really rooted in your love and passion towards every living thing, as you were mentioning. Um, how is your passion for environmental justice connected to your Lakota culture and identity that views the earth as family? Um, well, I think my passion is my culture. So like, um, I grew up, you know, thinking that to take care of your family and to protect your family. And then I then I get older, and I realize that my family isn't just my siblings or my parents or my cousins. It's everything. My family is um, every living being. And that's kind of when I like wanted to learn more about the environment and about the earth and how I can help. And I also think that I also learned through stories and just going to my school and like taking all these indigenous classes that um, Unchimaka or Grandmother Earth uh, protected us all these years and has been there for us for generations and that I need to do my part in protecting her Beautiful, Paisley. Um, I think there's a lot that we can all learn from um, the wisdom of uh, indigenous communities and 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 from the Lakota culture in terms of that that reverence and respect for creation and and really looking uh, at at Mother Nature, um, right? Uh, in in that way in that way um, as family. Um, Paisley, how, how does environmental justice um, impact your community? If you can talk a little bit just from, from, from your perspective. Well, I think there's a lot of different aspects on how it impacts the community. One, I think that a lot of people um, aren't as educated on environmental um, issues as they should be. And it's it's like the little things like, I did a service project uh, picking trash out of the uh, ditches around my like community. And a few days later after that, like I spent two days cleaning up the trash out of this ditch. And then a few days later, it was all back. And I think it's just about people not knowing these little things that impact their environment. And even the bigger things like our water, um, our water isn't the healthiest. It's healthy enough to drink, but there are still small traces of things in our water. And I just, I think it's a lot about people not knowing or not wanting to do anything or not knowing how to do um, how to how to go forth with a plan, basically. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Kind of um, raising 
awareness. Um, and, and Paisley, you mentioned uh, the importance of water. Uh, and I know that uh, you participated in the teach-in last year and, and you did a session on, on water is life. And um, what is the, the kind of that sacred value of, of water uh, for your community? Um, well, like it said, water is life. Water is like what keeps everything healthy and what keeps everything living has all your nutrients in it. Um, and I think in a deeper meaning, it brings everything back together and it keeps us safe in a way. I think, um, that is probably one of the most important things that we think about of think about it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That it it it, it water connects all of us, right? And it's also, um, like you said, water is life, and 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 water is is um, such a common thread through through so many of the um, environmental justice and climate change issues that that we're facing. Uh, today. Well, it's, it's exciting to hear from all of you, uh, you know, just working in, in such different capacities uh, from, from where you are within, within your schools. Um, and so now I'd just like to throw out a couple questions uh, to, to all of you. Uh, so, you know, feel free to feel free to jump in. But one of the things I was curious about is, is how did the mission of Jesuit education and the teachings of Laudato Si play a role in your environmental justice work? One of the Jesuit charisms that I previously mentioned was being men and women formed with others. Uh, and that's really shown within the care for our common home, which shows that like we have to care for everything that under God's creation, including the earth and everything within it. And we have to respect everyone doing that. And I think that the charisms and especially Laudato Si, which I've read in several classes, truly highlight what we need to hold dear to us while we act and try and pursue um, life. Absolutely. Yeah, kind of that that aspect of, of service and, and being men and women for others. Um, and you know, Pope Francis, I'll, I'll share one small thing from 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 my part, kind of, uh, you know, Pope Francis when he talks about the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. And, and I know that uh, in in our work, we're in the Office of Justice Ecology at the Jesuit conference and, and a lot, a lot of times in the organization, the Jesuit network is really looking to bring um, the concerns of of um, people on the margins and put that at the at the center at the center of our work as well how do we walk with how do we walk with communities um, yeah it Paisley and you were at the you were at the teach-in last year um, with the water is life session what 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 did what was that experience like for you? I mean, I guess I just bring that up as an example, kind of there are these, there are these great opportunities that you all get to participate in um, as part of the, the Jesuit network. And, you know, kind of how does that, how does that shape your, your experience, I guess, um, or perspectives working on these issues? Um, well, uh, the fam the teaching was, very different, like it was a very different environment um, than what I'm used to. And I think it opened my eyes more to the fact that there are a lot of issues going around, like going around the world and um, kind of made me want to learn more about different places and the environmental issues that are going on there. And I think that um, my school, my school is important, like it's very special because it teaches both like a Catholic 
um, teaching and in, uh, indigenous Lakota beliefs. And I think that my school gives a lot of opportunities for um, indigenous uh, students to go and learn more about issues, not just environmental, but social issues that need to be talked more about and gives us um, a bigger voice in a way. Yeah, beautiful, Paisley. I know that, um, and I was at that session with you, but I know that I thought it was really beautiful to have that interchange, that exchange between uh, between you and the students at Red Cloud and 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 the other students from different schools uh, at the teach-in. You know, just having those that ability to to learn from each other, uh, and you know, really excited at Red Cloud how. Like you said, there's this ability to really um, both bring together Catholic values and honor uh, Lakota tradition and values, um, which I, I think is 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 just a, a beautiful way of of uh, of, of going about uh, going about things. Um, wonderful. Well, for what about um, what experiences? in your environmental advocacy have been impactful or, or challenging? And again, that one's for any, for any of you, kind of maybe, yeah, what's been impactful or challenging? See what you've for done. me, I think part of something that's challenging sometimes is staying positive because a lot of times when we read about things that are going on in the world um, and how humans are impacting the environment negatively, it can make me very sort of pessimistic. And I feel like, like what, what can I do that will change anything? But then I can also read about things that are going well, things like new technologies that are, that are being created and being advanced that um, are going to make things better. And I can sort of go back to that positive outlook, like the things that I do can matter and we can change things and make it better. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, go ahead, Gabby. Uh, I was going to say kind of going off of that, we've experienced a little bit of that as well, where change is really difficult. Uh, and it is hard, especially when you have conflicting ideologies. Because although I go to a Catholic Jesuit institution, we see over and over within our divestment discussions, this kind of polarization between two views, both moral and a financial and economic side, where it's kind of like we're trying to decide where we are going to put all of our time and effort into it, like how we should be spending our money and our efforts. And I feel like you kind of have to take into account both perspectives and try and find the best way through it and using your own mission, especially that within our Catholic organizations, we know that we must stand for the most vulnerable and climate change and global warming really will affect those people and uh, communities. And I think it's most important that we do see that change and we advocate for it. And I know it sometimes can be really difficult, but always knowing that there are people out there that are willing to talk with you. Because I know when we started our movement, we went to the teach-in and actually sat in on meetings about divestment. And it actually got us going and more fired up about being able to go back to school and have action items to actually enact change. Yeah, wow. I mean, that's exciting. I think both the, the feeling of being energized, right, at the, at the teach-in and with that space with being with other young people um, and to be able to get energized about issues that you all feel passionate about. Uh, and also um, the point about, and, and I, I think this is actually a gift from our, from, from our Catholic faith too, and, and just about being able to come together and, and be in dialogue and, and to talk to one another, um, even though we can have differing views, right? Um, but yet we have these values that do bring us together. And, and, I, and I think that, that help us to have these conversations in a constructive 
uh, and and in a positive in a positive way. What about um, like in terms of how how can young people like yourself uh, get involved in environmental activism? Uh, kind of what words of wisdom would you like to share with young people uh, who want to take action like you are all doing to, to care for a common home and one another? I would say look into different organizations and entities around your community that you could become a part of that hold those same and similar values that you want to try and get involved with, especially with environmental justice and activism. But if you're not seeing something, create dialogue, make sure that you can continue to start questioning things. And if you don't end up having a group start forming, start one yourself. You can do something your, yourself and more people will follow suit. And as long as you start having those discussions, action will then be caused because of it and you can make a very big difference. I think to go off of what um, Gabby said, um, yeah, take your own opportunities um, or make your own opportunities. Um, kind of like wedge your way in to get involved. And if you have to just research it or like research whatever you're interested in. You're, you have to be interested in something like <laughs> to want to research it. Like not just with like environmental issues, but with social issues, with anything advocacy. Yeah, I think like they basically said it, do what you can and get involved in your community and be informed about the things that you're passionate about. Um, and then call on other people to join you and to learn about what you're interested in and to share what they're interested in and then try to start talking about things and working for change. Beautiful. And not only call on the people around you and within your society, but also your representatives. You can, they are able to make a larger impact. And once you call them, they can be able to create legislative change. Wonderful ladies. Yes, I mean, uh, following your passion, uh, that's what I'm hearing and learning, right? Being curious about uh, learning more and doing that research, uh, bringing in others, other partners, other other leaders, whether they're uh, leaders in our institutions or whether they're leaders within our government and Congress, but engaging uh, in that way with, with others. Excellent, excellent. Well, now I'm gonna turn it over to Chris uh, Chris Kerr, because I think he has some questions from the audience who have been watching you, you all um, on YouTube and Facebook. So Chris, take it away. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Cecilia. We do have some questions that have been shared uh, with us. And um, the, the first question, uh, someone asked, why is it so hard for our society to uh, care for creation? Why do we, why are we struggling as a society uh, to respond to the realities of climate change. I'd be really curious to hear the uh, three of you offer some perspectives on this. Why don't we start? Um, Ellen, what do you think? Why, why is this so hard? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I kind of wonder about it myself. But I think, I think we have habits, we have societal habits about what we are, what we buy and what we use and how we live our lives. And those habits aren't always good for the environment. Um, and I think also there's money involved, like um, Gabby's work with divestment is important because people have spent money on things that are harming the environment. And now we need to, since there's more awareness that uh, we need to change things, we need to spend our money in places that are helping the environment instead. Sure. Speaking of Gabby, why don't we go to Gabby next? Uh, what do you think, Gabby? Yeah, I'd say that kind of what Ellen was saying, we are really stuck in our habits and the way that things have always been. And I think it was really highlighted within Laudato Si where it, the technocratic paradigm where we think, oh, we'll find some technology that can fix uh, 
our global warming and climate issues. So there's no need that we need to individually worry about it. But I think it's come about where we are very materialistic and habitually that has created more of a sense of individualism instead of collectivism. So in order for us to work together for our common home, we have to care for our uh, every person around us within our community and within our world. And Paisley, what about for you? Um, I think they both kind of said it, but I want to like speak more about how um, money is basically the reason why people don't want to change. Uh, these large corporations have the, um, the, what's the word? basically the stage to the platform to um, make a change and people will follow what they do. And I think that um, also that change is hard and these people and us people are so stuck in our ways that we don't want to change. And also um, this negative mindset of what's going to like be like if we change what's going to happen, like nothing's really going to happen. I think that has been placed in our minds by these large corporations who just use money to do what they want that doesn't really help the environment. And Paisley, I mean, your community has been impacted by the actions of, of large corporations. Is there anything you want to share about that? Um, I just want to say that it sucks not feeling like you don't have a voice. It sucks thinking that you can't make a change and that you can't speak up for yourself. But I think um, my community or any other indigenous community have been showing that we have a voice and that we can speak up for ourselves. And not, all the, not always will people listen to us, but we get our statements out there. And we have learned to um, not be pushed over by larger corporations or um, higher ranked people. Sure, sure. Thanks for that, Paisley. Another question that came in was, who inspires you? So as you think about the work that you've been doing um, on your campus at your school, who is someone, maybe someone that everyone knows or someone that only people in your community know, but who, who's inspiring you in the work you do? Uh, let's, uh, let's switch it up. Gabby, why don't you go first? Um. So within my community and at my school, I would say that there are several teachers that are very environmentally focused that I've taken classes from who have sparked my interest in wanting to learn more and get further engaged. So I just took an environmental sociology class this semester and we had to research a group within our community that does uh, environmental activism. And I learned a lot more about transportation habits and ways in which we should sit, shift that. Um, but on a larger scale, I work at within Cara Eastman's campaign. She's running as a representative for Nebraska, and she's really inspired me to be an advocate for what I want to see change. And I think that she really upholds the same morals that I do within environmental activism. And I hope that once she is elected, we're able to see further growth and change. Thanks, Gabby. Uh, Paisley, how about for you? Who, who inspires you? Um kind of hard to pinpoint one person that inspires me, but I would like to think, um, um, my, so my, this semester, my, uh, indigenous literature class, I had a teacher and their name was, uh, their name is Lurie. And I think they inspired me a lot because they taught me, um, a lot more on indigenous things and environmental issues and issues in general and kind of uh, supported me to be more outspoken about what I believe in and my passions. Also, um, activist groups like No Dapple, they inspire me and they give me a voice because to know that um, indigenous people aren't ignored in this society. Thanks, Paisley. And Ellen, what about for you? Who inspires you? Um, the teacher moderator of our green team, Mrs. Mm -hmm. Ken, she really inspires me because she like 
she's very passionate about working for the environment and she knows how to communicate with other people to get those things done. And I think also um, other individuals and companies who are working for envir environmental justice or to change something that helps the environment really inspire me, like um, companies that are making alternatives to plastic or recycling clothes or that kind of thing, they inspire me because they are kind of their representative of how our society can change and how we can we don't we might not have to fix everything if we can change the way that we're using our resources now thanks ellen uh the last question that we had uh is a little bit complex so i'll try to narrow it down a little bit but Basically, the, the person noted that uh, your generation, uh, folks in high school, college, uh, right now, um, are often identified as the generation that cares most about, about the earth and about responding to climate change and things like that. Um, and it's been pointed out, though, also that in a way, like the actions that we're, we're taking as global citizens today will probably impact the rest of your life, okay? And um, everything about your life for the next however many wonderful years that you live. You think about your lifetime. What is one thing you hope happens in regards to caring for creation, responding to the realities of environmental degradation, responding to climate change? What's one thing that you hope will happen in your lifetime and will give you a great sense of, of, of joy and, and gladness if it, if it takes place. And why don't we start with, well, let's see, why don't we start with Paisley this time? <laughs> it's a big question. Um, it's a big question. There's a lot of things I would like to see happen. But if I had to choose one for my lifetime, um, I think it would be, sorry, I'm thinking, it's a lot. <laughs> um, I think it would be probably um, deforestation uh, to um, all come to a consensus that we don't need to cut down trees to, or like massively cut down trees just for like whatever, for cattle or for paper or any mm. other nonsense thing. Um, I think I would, I would like to see that become that problem, that issue become fixed within my lifetime, just because trees like hold a lot of ground for, um, people as a whole or the environment as a whole. Sure. Thank you, Paisley. And Ellen, how about you? Um, I think one thing that I would really like to see is, uh, widespread alternative to plastic um, because plastic has really harmful effects on the environment and it doesn't go away. So if we can find something or we can massively shift as a society away from plastic, that would be that would make me really hopeful that we can make other changes too. Great. Thanks, Ellen. And Gabby, how about for you? Um, I would say the adoption of sustainability practices within our common everyday everyday uses and lifestyles where we'll have renewable energy based upon governmental action to be more sustainable, but then we'll also have changes in habits, which a lot of us stated as one of our main driving factors for what we individually can do, but then also a shift from industrialization where we're no longer seeing so much of a like carbon footprint between each and every one of us and a drive away from materialism. Great, thanks. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Cecilia for a second to, to offer some closing remarks before we finish up this broadcast. Thanks, Chris. Um, thank you to, to you, Paisley, Ellen, and Gabby for sharing your, your insights on environmental activism. Um, I think all of us are inspired by your actions and your passion and your, your energy and your commitment. 
and you know we're, we are excited about how we can continue to, to work together um, as an Ignatian family uh, to walk together to care for our common home and, and to care for one another. So thanks so much for, for being with us today. Great. Thanks, Cecilia. Thank you for hosting, for facilitating this conversation. And again, thanks to Ellen, Gabby, and Paisley uh, for, for being part of this. Before we finish up, uh, we want to invite you to, to join in uh, the collective efforts of the Ignatian Solidarity Network and the Jesuit Conference Office of Justice and Ecology. Um, you can join us in calling on Congress to support legislation that would increase air pollution standards and oversight especially for mercury and other toxic metals, and for policies that uphold environmental impact studies as required by the National Environment Policy Act in order to improve the health and quality of life of vulnerable populations, such as children, and low-income communities who are often the most directly affected by pollution, roll, uh, pollution rollbacks. Um, you can take action right now using your cell phone. You can text AIR, A-I-R, to 202-800-1541 to send a message uh, to your members of Congress to call for clean air and to protect the vulnerable. And we hope you will join the Ignatian Solidarity Network in sending this message today. Uh, thank you again for being part of this broadcast. We're grateful to have all those who joined us online. Um, if you're wondering, this will be available uh, via recording. Uh, it's available on our YouTube page as well as the uh, on the Facebook page of both the Ignatian Solidarity Network and the Jesuit Conference of Canada and the United States. Thanks again for joining. Have a great day.